could have seen the sanctuary of First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, you would have seen that it was completely full. I'm not just talking about the pews. I'm talking about the aisles, the windowsills, the stairwells, all the way up to the balcony. Everybody was there. And standing in front of them at the pulpit was a 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. And as they looked at his face, they could see that he was weary. And as he looked at theirs, he could see that they were weary too. You see, it was January 1956, and the Montgomery bus boycott was now two months old. And the daily grind of walking to work, of ride shares, of the petty harassments, of the threats, of the job loss, of the violence, it was starting to wear on everybody. Now, adding to that weariness, the the leaders of the boycott had just decided that day that they were going to change the goals of the bus boycott. They weren't simply going to try to integrate the buses. They were actually going to challenge segregation itself in federal court. And the task of presenting that decision to all of the strikers gathered there in that sanctuary fell, of course, to Martin Luther King Jr. Now, at the beginning of the strike, his words had inspired them in ways that seemed almost miraculous. And night after night during the strike, they came again to hear him remind them of not only the truth but the beauty of their cause and render their very ordinary labor into the elevated language of the kingdom of God. And that night, about 2,000 people had come because in challenging segregation, they were crossing a threshold and they knew it. But they had no idea how painful that crossing was gonna become because they sat there gathered together in that sanctuary, just across town, a few blocks away, actually, the young pastor's home with his wife and baby child inside was destroyed by a bomb. Now, King's first sense that something was wrong came about halfway through the service. It was during the offertory, and he saw messengers coming through the back and leave again with a look of sick worry on their faces. And he called his friend, Ralph Abernathy, and asked, Ralph, what's happening? And he told us straight. He said, Martin, your house has been bombed, and I don't know what happened to Coretta and the baby. Upon hearing the news, King stepped to the pulpit, asked for the congregation's attention, and then with the calm that was to become his trademark, he told them what had happened. He told them to go home in peace. And they exited out the side door. The crowd did not go home in peace. In fact, the cries and the wails that that followed him out into the night indicated that all of the weariness of the past few weeks, centuries, was beginning to boil over. And before he even got home, there was a crowd of several hundred African Americans standing in his front yard with sticks, knives, guns. When they got there, they encountered a barricade of white policemen, which did not improve their mood. Because they understood that if those policemen were not the perpetrators of the crime, then certainly they were protecting those who were. And violence was all over the place in the air. And King stepped into that scene. He made his way through the crowd up onto the the rubble of his shattered front porch into the front room of his house where he found the police commissioner, the fire chief, and three reporters in his front room. They gestured to the back room. He went in the back. He found Coretta and the baby shaken but mercifully unhurt took care of them, they checked one another over tenderly, they prayed with surrounded by some members of the congregation, and they created their own little sanctuary there in the midst of the ruins. But that moment couldn't last because the violence outside was about to break out, and so the police commissioner asked King if he would come and address the crowd to try, as he put it, to calm things down. And King agreed. He walked away from his family, through the front room, out onto the front porch where the glass and the wood were shattered, He faced that crowd of policemen, congregants, and he raised his hand over them, and this is what he said. Everything is all right. Don't panic. Don't do anything panicky. Don't get your weapons. If you have your weapons, take them home. Remember that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. That is what Jesus said. We are not advocating violence. We want to love our enemies. I want you to love your enemies. Be good to them. This is what we must live by. We must meet hate with love. Now, what was happening in that moment when that young black pastor stepped onto the shattered ruins of his white home and and stood in front of that mixed crowd, raised his hand over them and asked them to love one another? What kind of act was that? Well, in one respect, it it was a personal act. He wanted everybody to know he was okay. His wife and baby were okay. In another sense, it was a pastoral act. He wanted his congregation to remember their confession of faith and to resist the temptation of violence. 
But in a much more fundamental sense, it was a public act. Because when Martin Luther King stepped onto the ruins of that porch, he stepped into the ruins of his city and in the ruins of American democracy that was tearing itself apart with violence. And he asked us to reimagine our life together on the basis of love. Of all the things that you could know about Martin Luther King Jr., the most important thing for you to know is this, that all of his life and work had one goal, and that goal, love made flesh in the streets of this world. He wanted to see us and our cities transformed into the shape of love. And over the past year or so, a number of years, a lot of you in this room, a lot of us around the country have stepped out into the ruins of our own cities, Memphis, Baltimore, and Ferguson, Charlottesville, where I spend most of my time. Yes, that's Charlottesville. And we've seen this terrible time as we've tried to heal one another and heal our communities from the concussive trauma of habitual racial violence. It's been terrible. But one of the things that has struck me in this is how prominent King has become in all of these discussions. I mean, as I've watched these dramas unfold around the United States, I've seen his face everywhere. I mean, his words are on our signs, his face is on our murals, his, his voice is sampled in our songs. And as a King scholar, I've experienced this in complicated ways. On the one hand, I, I found it encouraging. Now, many of us may not realize that King was not always as axiomatic as he, as he seems to us now. In fact, beginning in 1965, King began a long and highly publicized diminishment where his view of democracy as a brotherhood and sisterhood based on love was slowly set aside for a vision of democracy based on identitarian politics and struggles for power. He himself noted this diminishment and he lamented it, both because of what it implied about him and what it portended for America. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe we realize that this isn't working. Maybe we realize that we need his vision. Maybe we think we need King, that that would be encouraging. But it mostly has struck me as unsettling, and here's why. Because I've heard a lot of talk about King, but I have not heard a lot of talk about love. Honestly, except for the highly nonspecific love wins that I see everywhere. I've heard almost no substantive talk about love, about what it is, what it comes, where it comes from, what it obligates us to do and to be as men and women and children. And that unsettles me because it makes me think that rather than wanting the king that calls us to love, that we might want some other king. King, the highly quotable civic abstraction. King, the one who mysteriously agrees with all of us all of a sudden. King, the talisman that we can summon to assure ourselves that we are on the right side of history and that the moral arc of the universe bends where else? Towards ourselves. It's unsettling because it means that while we might actually need king, we might not actually really want him. And if that's true, and I think it is, then that means for me that we need to re-engage King, not as an extension of ourselves, not as a totem that symbolizes what we all already know, but as the other he always was, as the voice crying in the wilderness that remains largely unknown to us. Now imagine for a moment that we could go out into that wilderness and listen to that voice. What would it say to us? What would it call us to do and to be? On the one hand, in one respect, it would call us to see with the eyes of love, to see with the eyes of love. That is to see ourselves, to see one another, and yes, even our mortal enemies as creatures made by and for love, as creatures that bear an irreducible glory that demands our honor and our protection, as creatures that bear incredible pain Wounds that are both spiritual and structural in nature. As creatures that bear infinite possibility. And that requires us to refuse to reduce one another to our worst selves. That's what it would call us to, to see with the eyes of love. And look, we live in a time where we are taught to view one another through the eyes of contempt and mutual recrimination. To spot one another's weaknesses and call it insight. To shame one another in public and call it courage. It is not it is destroying us. And in this moment, what we need is a voice of love that calls us to see with the eyes of love. Secondly, it would call us to take up the works of love, to take up the works of love. That is to say, to work, to see the instantiation of love in the individual lives and institutional ecologies of all of our cities. And that means to struggle. That means to struggle, to see love come into all of these institutions, in law, in education, in economics, in policing, 
in military and foreign policy, to see love take shape in those institutions and to see those institutions accountable to the obligations of love and to struggle for that and not to stop. But it also means to do that, to do that, to seek that change only with the tools of love, to hold ourselves accountable to the obligations of love as we do so. Refusing to see love as an end and not as a means. We want to see it as a means as well. And look, we live in a time when there are so many guardians of the status quo that resist social change of any kind. And there's so many other people that are willing to seek social change, as they should, but with any means necessary, including violence that destroys them, their neighbors, and the possibility of democratic peace. And in this moment, what we need, the voice of love that calls us not only to see with the eyes of love, but to take up the works of love. And lastly, he would call us to embrace the sufferings of love. To embrace the sufferings of love. One of the most painful contradictions of King's life and work is that while he dreamed so much for America, he experienced so little of that dream for himself. I mean, this one that dreamed of a beloved community was called the most hated man in America. This one who dreamed of economic prosperity for us all had very little to his name. And this one who dreamed of the power of nonviolence died from a gunshot to the face about two blocks from where you sit. And the dramatic nature of these discrepancies could lead us to believe that King's suffering was somehow unique to him. It was singular. In an important sense, that is, of course, true. But in another sense, it's not true. Because King understood that his suffering was not novel. It was normal. It was normal for everybody who would take up the work of love and walk in those ways. Because he understood that love is not something that wins. It is something that is won by men and women and children that are willing to take up love and bear its marks on their bodies. And in a time that we live in, where the avoidance of suffering is the highest good and where almost nothing asks us to give ourselves for the good of our neighbors, we need this voice that calls us to love. So over the course of this day, each of us is going to leave this room. We're going to step out into the ruins of our own lives, our own cities, and we're going to take up our work. All the different work is represented in this room. It's amazing. We're going to leave this sanctuary and Go get it done. As we do, what voice are we going to listen to? I came from Charlottesville to say one thing, to plead with you, my brothers and sisters, to choose the voice of love, the voice that calls us to see one another with the eyes of love, to take up the works of love, and to embrace the sufferings of love, the voice of love that comes through the voice of King. And that may not be the voice that we want, but it is absolutely the voice that we need. Thank you.